Hey gang, I hope you're having a good day. Welcome to part two of the article in Trains Magazine of the Deep Water Revival. Here we go. The hill. At the beginning of the 20th century, plenty of coal was flowing off the deep water railroad. But its owners were forced to pay the CNO or the No Folk in Western to take the coal to market. Not satisfied with their prices, when the line's primary investors, Standard Oil magnate Henry Huddleston Rogers, decided to do something about it. In 1907, Rogers founded and began construction of his own rail outlet to Taiwan, the only railroad ever to be financed solely by one man. Because the Virginian Railway was built after the CNO and the Norfolk and Western, better construction technology was available. This was fortunate because the CNO and the NW had already claimed the best route through the Alleghenies. Like an insurmountable wall, the Great Allegheny Plateau rises to the east of the Mullins. The Virginian Railway attacks Flat Top Mountain with a 2% grade, snaking like a great iron serpent from the valley floor to the top of the ridge. Rogers employed the very best engineering and construction available at the end of the 20th century to build his railway. Massive steel bridges carried the line over valleys and streams, dwarfing all over intrusions of man, but dwarfed themselves by the mountains. At Garwood, the line curves out of Guniata Creek and makes a giant backward zest as he climbs to the summit at Clark's Gap, punching through five tunnels in those last four miles. Operations on the hill have never been easy. Virginian railway lore is filled with stories of runways and wrecks broken knuckles, and worn-out brake shoes. Even today, conductors can be found walking their trains, swinging their flashlights through cold winter nights, trying to find the cause of an emergency brake application. In the 1910s, the hill became such a traffic bottleneck that management decided to electrify the entire division. In 1923, wires were strung over 132 miles of the Virginians' main line between Mullins and Roanoke. Boxcab electrics replaced steam on most trains, except mine runs and passenger ones. Electrification eased the burden of getting trains over the hill, but did not eliminate it. Because of the steep grades and heavy tonnage, most loaded coal trains were moved upgrade in two sections. Each section was called a hill run and consisted of head and power half the train, a caboose, and pushes. The first hill run would tie down its hoppers in one of the sidings at Clark's Gap. Then each set of power would return separately to Elmore Yard for the second cut of hoppers. At Clark's Gap, the train was reassembled and taken east by the head end power while the pushers returned to Elmore for their next shove. Electrification ended in 1962, three years after the NW merger, but that did little to change the operating patterns. 
even today with 4,000 horsepower behemoths from GE and EMD shouldering the tonnage, some trains are still doubled over the hill. The Conrail merger did not have as dramatic an impact on the ex virginian Railway east of Mullins as it did on the line going north. But effects of the Deepwater Revival have certainly trickled down to the hill. In fact, it may never be known just how much the merger did for the line east of Mullins. The hill has always been the funnel for eastbound coal flowing off the Virginians' branches. When even, even when traffic on the deep water line was almost non-existent, mines on the winding Gulf branch and Guyandot River line kept coal moving over Clark's Gap. Unfortunately, as some mines started playing out and others began shipping coal to power plants in the Midwest, even the hill was starting to get quiet. With traffic down to only one or two hill runs a day, and has even considered the line for abandonment, but those ideas got washed away with the Conrail merger. After the deep water turn rolls into Elmore Yard, a new crew will come on duty to take it east. Most trains from deep water are just short enough to be taken over the hill in a single cut. Upon reaching the summit, the pushers will cut off and return to Elmore for another, <coughs> for either another sub or a trip north on an empty train. The road crew will continue taking the train east to Roanoke. Finding a train. As is the case with so many branch and secondary lines, finding a train can be quite a challenge. Even with the increased activity, traffic levels are still far below those of most main lines. To further complicate matters, cold trains run 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, but rarely on any sort of schedule. In a 24-hour period on the Deepwater Line, there will usually be one or two loaded trains heading to Mullins and as many empties returning to the mines. All those trains also operate via Clark's Gap and it is common for at least one and sometimes two trains to come off the Guyandat River line to go east as well. Trains from the Guyandat are often long enough to require doubling, light pusher movements, and one or two empty trains returning to the Guyandat round operations in a typical 24 hours on the hill. Mullins and Deepwater are the best places to start looking for trains on the Princeton Deepwater District. Both offer several possibilities for activity, and Deepwater has the added bonus of being on the CSX's former CNO main line. In addition to several mainline trains on CSX, in the long days of summer, the gully trolley can also be photographed at deep water. This caboose carrying local from South Charleston runs across the MS Bridge over the Kanawha River several evenings each week to serve the Alka Meadows plant that alloy and interchange with NS. Due to the unscheduled nature of coal train operations, Tugging to a railroad employee is often the best way to learn when trains will be running. Most employees on the former Virginian lines are friendly and receptive to courteous inquiries. Just be sure to explain your intentions, observe all signs and warnings, and above all, be careful. Good advice. Following the train. Once the train is found, it is possible to give chase and photograph it in several locations. The big bridge over the Kanawha River is a highlight of the line and is accessible from US 60 on the North Bank and West Virginia Route 61 on the South Bank. 
Just keep in mind that the closest road bridges to Deepwater and Alloy are located at Montgomery to the west and Kanawha Falls to the east. To follow an empty train up to one of the mines, take US 60 east to Gali Bridge and go up the Gali River on West Virginia 3916. Both the roads and tracks split at Belva, just north of <clears throat> just north of town off Route 16. 20 mile Creek Road follows the first few miles of the branch to Fola. The branch to High Power Mountain is roughly parallel by Route 39, except for the stretch between Swiss and Lockwood, where the tracks run along an isolated portion of the Gali River. Back at Deepwater, West Virginia 61 parallels the line as far as Oak Hill Junction. There, the tracks make a 90-degree turn and bypass the town of Oak Hill. The fastest way to rejoin the tracks involves going through Oak Hill and taking US-19 a few miles south to West Virginia 612 West. To be safe, get several miles ahead of the train before Oak Hill Junction. After about 3 miles on 612, look for County Road 15 and 2 on the right, which goes under a high steel trestle and rejoins 612 at Darth and a second high steel trestle. After another 3 miles on 612, turn left on small road that joins 612 with CR 23. Or County Route 23. Turn left on 23 and look for the tracks in a few miles. County Road 23 parallels both the tracks and the West Virginia Turnpike for several miles. South of Pax at the small town of Kurtzville, 23 turns away from the tracks, but County Road 7 follows them south past two more big bridges to West Virginia 3, near Beckley. Take Route 3 west to Survey, where Sussex Branch crosses over the NS. From there, continue following the tracks on West Virginia 305 to Leicester, and then West Virginia 54 all the way to Mullins. The old mining town of Slab Fort is a popular photo spot, as the tracks soar over the town on a high trestle. At Mullins, West Virginia 54 ends at West Virginia 16. Take 16 south through town, past the old car barn, and on to Elmore Yard, where 16 meets West Virginia 10. To the west, 10 and 16 run together and follow the Guayandai River line, although from the opposite bank of the river. To go up the hill toward Clark Gap, Take the bridge on West Virginia 10 over the south end of Elmore Yard. West Virginia 10 south follows the tracks for several miles up the hill, yielding several photo opportunities. Thanks to the Virginians' proliferation of big steel bridges in those majestic West Virginia hills, traces of the electric electrification still exist in the form of catenary pools on the bridges at Bud and Garwood. At Garwood, the road and the railroad split, taking different routes over Flattop Mountain. About five miles up the hill from Garwood, County Road 1, Clark's Gap Road, turns off to the right, winds up the mountain, and rejoins the tracks at the Summit Tunnel. From there, County Road 11 follows the... Bridge on West Virginia 10 over the south end of Elmore Yard. West Virginia 10 follows the tracks for several miles up the hill, yielding several photo opportunities. Thanks to the Virginians' proliferation of big steel bridges and those majestic West Virginia hills, traces 
of the electrification still exist in the form of canary pools. Wait, I think I already read that. That's weird. That's on the same page. The same other page. <laughs> okay. That's strange. Must be a typo. Long, long typo or some shit. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think that's just a long typo. They like repeated the word on the other page. Okay, I guess we okay. I got with the road and the railroad split, taking different routes over Flat Top Mountain. About five miles up the hill from Godwood, County Road one, Clark's Gap Road, turns off to the right, winds up the mountain, and rejoins the tracks at the summit tunnel. From there County Road eleven follows the line to Motoaka. Madawaka, past the Saudis where Hill runs a double together and pushes cut off. Ex-Virginian trackage continues east for several miles to Kelseysville, where it joins the Pokey Main. When chasing trains on the Princeton Deepwater District, keep in mind that empty trains and light power move much faster than loaded trains making loaded trains much easier to overtake. Remember that loaded trains usually have more power on both ends, yielding more photo opportunities. Also consider that the line between deep water and Mullins runs mostly north-south, meaning northbound empty trains are backlit for much of the year when the sun is in the southern sky. A good state atlas, like a DeLorme or a set of county maps, is highly recommended to avoid becoming hopelessly lost or utterly confused in the hills and hollows of the mountain state. And most importantly, remember to be safe and have fun. The future. All too often, those old-time country church revivals did not leave a lasting impact on the congregation. The traveling minister would move on to another town, the tents would be taken down, and the church would slowly return to its sleepy pre-revival state. So far, that has not been the case on the deep water line. Over three years after the Conrail merger, revival is still alive and well on the ex-Virginian. Cold trains from Fola and High Power Mountain continue to roll south every day. Even floods that ravaged the area in the summer of 2001 could not shake the railroad. And its maintenance crews were on the scene immediately, repairing damaged bridges and washouts. Trains were rolling again within a week. The long-term outlook of any eastern coal-dependent railroad is not easy to predict. With the Conrail merger came speculation that NS may use the West Virginia secondary and the Princeton Deepwater District as a through route for freight and intermodal traffic between uh, moving between Columbus and the southeast. That speculation has diminished since the merger, but remains a possibility with the right economic conditions. For now, though, the former Virginian Railway makes its living by moving coal just as it was built to do. How long that will last is anyone's guess. With the ever-changing nature of the coal market, routings and mining operations can change almost overnight. Fortunately, both Fuller and Power Mountain have enough coal reserves to continue mining for many years. As long as customers in the southeast want that coal, Anas will keep bringing it to them over one of the most dramatic mountain railroads in the East. It is a show not to be missed. Interesting stuff. Be back with some pictures. Nice scene. Uh, 
Uh, this guy that just did his map, I know it's probably hard to see, but that's the map of all the places along the road. It's pretty, pretty wide system. Oh no, dude, this is video on the NS Deep Water Revival. How good they got here to get?